Hi, my name's Deborah Lucero. Welcome to Butte Views and Beyond. This is a show about cultural arts and happenings in the North State. And we have very special in-studio guests today, the art officials. And I'm very excited. They're getting ready to do a fundraiser for Monca, the Museum of Northern California Art. And they are all very accomplished artists, and we are very fortunate to have them with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Caitlin, do you want to um, introduce your crew? I would. We're a, we're a loose art gang of <laughs> ladies. Um, I'm a painter. Um, Cynthia's uh, also a painter in caustic. Robin is an extreme sculpturer. <laughs> Susan um, does beautiful totems, uh, ceramicist, and <clears throat> Chung Hong is um, a beloved and very well-known painter of East and Western um, art influences. Art influence and paintings. Have, yes. Eve and Eve Werner, who's not here, who um, is doing some beautiful horse paintings, and um, we wish she could have been here, but she couldn't be here. So let's first talk about why you're all here today, which is the Monca fundraiser, which is going to be happening on September, September 18th. 18th. For those who aren't familiar with what's going on, the old Veterans Hall, which is on the Esplanade, which has been sitting vacant for as long as I can remember, I think, yeah. um, is going to be occupied by art. And that's the Museum of Northern California. And all of you are working toward that and have developed pieces around a certain theme for this particular event. And so maybe one of you could tell us a little bit about that theme and how that came about. About, I would say, maybe six months ago, I did two paintings in a row that ended up basically white. And they got a really strong response. And um, we decided to get together, as we usually do, probably once a month. And I was talking about these pieces. And then I said something like, oh, we should do a show about white. And uh, one of us discovered that there was a whole chapter in Moby Dick called The Whiteness of the Whale. And it was, Robin did that. And, uh, and it was just really profound. And then we really did start to talk about the notion of what, it, what came to us. And we all had these really great um, just inferences. And you can really tell that regardless of what happens, we each really got inspired to expand our work. Let's talk a little bit about that work, which will be at the fundraiser, and people will um, have an uh, opportunity to buy these pieces. They're at the central focal point of the evening. So, Caitlin, what inspired you for this particular art official's escapade? Well, we originally were going to do white, and now the title of the show is The Pale and Beyond, which kind of opened up more opportunities of work. Um, I had a beautiful pale white cat named Boris who was the subject of many of my photographs. Um, and now he's going to be the, photo, the, the muse of all of my paintings. The majority of my work is done with sponges. The detail work is done with brush. And um, I'm kind of a toddler painter. I don't, there, I don't know a lot of history. My main muse or inspiration was Dr. Seuss. And um, I'm an emotive painter, usually with a lot of color. So this is also a challenge. I think that's really interesting because, you know, what I know about artists is that it seems that you get in a rhythm and you get used to doing things a certain way. And sometimes it's, it's hard to come up with something new, maybe. But when you get some kind of um, guidelines that you have to go by or something that forces the creativity, it's amazing what can happen. Well, yeah, and it's like we've all been in a relationship and now we're in counseling and finding <laughs> new ways. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll get back to that. And Cynthia, why don't you talk just a little bit about what encaustic is for audience members who may not even understand what encaustic is. Encaustic originated in 3 um, AD when they used wax, hot wax, to cover the bottom of boats. And then somebody thought of carving into the material and adding some kind of um, stain. 
there's this famous thing called the Fayum portraits. They're covered, their sarcophagus is covered with these incredible wax paintings that are still perfectly intact because wax is the greatest adhesive of the world. And if it's kept at a certain temperature, it holds the molecules of color, nothing fades. So these portraits, which I haven't really seen a live one yet, but I plan to someday, um, they're perfectly preserved. And then the, the, the method was so labor intensive, you had to heat wax and do all this stuff that it was basically a dead art until, until the advent of electricity in the, you know, in the probably the 30s. And um, anyway, so it's just very, it's, you, you use um, melted wax, pigments, very intense pigments, and you can, the wax becomes a solid and a liquid at the same time. I mean, it's a liquid, then you paint it, it's a solid. But it's fun. Let's just say it's fun. Um, but I like to say I'm a mixed media painter who uses wax because you can uh, get into a label of encaustic and then everybody um, kind of goes in that direction. And my paintings use encaustic, but they're more about narrative. Yeah. Don't fence her in. Don't yeah. fence me in. <laughs> so you recently went to New Mexico, and um, the paintings that you you actually created, and, and you are a prolific painter, if I may say, and oh, um, you have, you. what, 11 pieces that you've created for this particular event? I have, th let's see, one, two, four encaustic pieces that I made, two started out white and they were kind of a, about a story and as the story evolved the last two didn't get into the white <laughs> <laughs> and then i have a um the pieces that you see here they're um paper they're just mixed media on paper those aren't wax but what happened is i got captivated by the sky and if anyone's been to new mexico you just take one look and you get this sense of awe that's incomprehensible and then the weather is so conflicted. And I just got captivated by the sky. I was a resident in Taos for 23 days. So the pieces that I have, they're going to be kind of hanging almost like a laundry line. It's not laundry, but they're going to be hanging from wire so you can see them. And then I'm going to have some more traditional pieces, too. So, Susan, we have in studio one of your totems. I, I noticed that you often put um, a bird mm -hmm on top um, and you what kind of birds have you done um, this one looks like this is a white dove the, the symbol for the white dove is peace and I feel like that's a good thing to bring more into the world and into myself and nature is always a theme for me um, so I have often have natural themes yeah and um, how long have you been doing ceramics? Were, were you trained as a ceramicist? No. <laughs> I started teaching at Bidwell Junior High, and they had, I was to teach a ceramics <laughs> class for the junior high students, and so that's when I started. <laughs> and I gradually, so it was this long, long process of learning um, about clay, different kinds of clay, and so I feel like a toddler in the clay, <laughs> the clay department too, because I ne I never I never mix glazes. I you know I just I I didn't come through studying on the job training. Yeah, yeah on the job training, and um, and actually when I I also really dove into s the ceramics when I was um, when I was pregnant with my first child because I started meeting with an art group and I just started creating art that related to mothering so uh, in with clay so I that's kind of I really dove in there yeah and now I'm now I, I just like to make these spheres I, I love making spheres and I love working with lots like lots of different textures and they I know I'm a, a rock person so they kind of have a feeling of rocks too and and do you impress upon the the different things or do you carve the... I carve um, so I have a couple, my leaf stamp, that's the only one that I have that's actually, that I don't carve, yeah. But the rest, all of them are individually made and there's no, I have no molds, I just make pinch pots and I put them together and I, and I, yeah. So freehand. Yeah, all freehand. Nice. And this um, is maybe leaning toward the pale. Actually when, they're all ceramic. Um, 
They, but when they are bisque fired, which is the first firing, they are really white. And when they're fired um, unglazed, when they're fired with uh, to the next firing, they turn that kind of off-white color. So, and I kind of like it. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. Now, had you done much of this where it, no. where it looked like this? So was this something you discovered no. through this process of the white concept? Yes, usually my work is all about color yeah. and texture and it's, but um, we decided to do, do this event and w my husband and I uh, traveled through Spain and Portugal this summer and we went to the Alhambra, which is in Granada, in, in the south of Spain, and, and ha there was a palace, and the walls there are carved, 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 with all these intricate patterns by the, the Moors that settled there, and it was remarkable, and I was very inspired by the, the intricacy of the, all the, the work that went into hundreds of years of, of, of work. I, I did a whirlwind tour in Europe, you know, going, I went to uh, Paris and London and Spain and just did art museums. And I have to tell you, when I did the Open Studios tour like that and just toured artists in our area, I was so amazed at the depth and the talent and the dedication and the beauty that just our little county has and really amazing artists. I mean... It really, yeah. truly, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> just some of them. I mean, we have some incredible artists, and um, I don't think that everybody out there understands how much great art we have in our area. They feel like they need to run to a metropolitan area to experience great art. And the truth is that we have great art. I think that we've been lacking a place to show great art, um, you know, and ha we, we have yet to have outside of the Janet Turner Museum on campus, which is really dedicated to prints, although it does have other types of art forms, you know, we haven't had an art museum in, in town. So I think having the Monka Museum is going to add a dimension to our, our art uh, world in, in this town. So I'm hoping that since it is all Northern California artists, and some of these artists are still living, which is even more encouraging, I hope. I, I would love to see a museum dedicated to living artists, <laughs> that you don't have to die before you get into a museum, which is often the case. Chun Hong, I wanted to um, turn our attention just briefly to you, because I know you have collectors all over the country. Um, I'm very grateful. You yes. know, it's a lot of people love my work. Um, um, it's it's a fortunate as an artist, I could survive, um, just do what I love. I, you know, I've been a fan for many years and um, actually have two beautiful pieces in my home of your work. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you first came on the scene, what you did was so different than what, uh, what anybody had really seen, um, the idea of... Uh, putting, um, almost framing uh, something that, was, that we all see in art, kind of traditional art, with this beautiful oriental touch. And the colors you use are just amazing. So tell us a little about yourself. I was a teacher, a public teacher uh, in Taiwan. Um, then uh, I had my own of, uh, art school as well. And I worked 14 hours a day in Taiwan. And I thought, you know, I need a break. <laughs> so I came here for my MA and I met my husband. And I realized all my life all I want to do just creating art. So I stay eighteen years ago and just be an artist and until now. And that's what you do full time. You know, it's not making any money, but you know, <laughs> surviving. Uh, but uh, the reason I do the incongruence theory, which in the past almost 10 years, so what I've been doing is the comp combine the classical oriental painting on outside of frame, which is bring from the Tang and the Song Dynasty in the, uh, China, China. But uh, I would say the most of it is in East Asia's type of the flavors in there. Then in the center, I put in the uh, classical 
European still life. For me, it has so much richness in there from the East and the West, especially from classical painting. And I like that the agents. Um, before this series, I was working on the, um, the uh, in my thesis, I was working on the uh, religion icons comparison, mm -hmm. which if you look at the back in the era, a lot of painting has this Krakow, uh, the agents, mm -hmm. uh, and you feel the spirits there. And so I bring all this in my work, uh, which is from me, and that is the reason make it special and different, because nobody's so crazy and put two, <laughs> 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 two culture together and uh, two painting together. But that's your whole life. Uh, that's whole my life. That's reflecting who I am and what's my experience, and that's how I see the world as well. You know, because um, I see the world is in one. We are on this earth. Um, we are come from the uh, oh, same source, yes. and uh, I don't see the the differences. But we can bring all our beauty, coexist in harmony and beauty. And that's the main thing in my painting. I want to bring this in there, and I hoping the people can re see that uh, in my work. Um, and of course, it's challenge doing the. Uh, the why and the beyond. <laughs> but you know, it, it's interesting. I'm beginning to see a theme, you know, emerge um, in in the pale and beyond. It seems that a uh, sense of um, finding, uh, stretching yourselves as artists to enter into that piece, um, because white is hard. It's difficult. It's a difficult. I would say in the process of learning the painting, the white, the black, and the transparent. <laughs> it's the three things I think the most difficult things. And you chose stones to put into the center of this particular piece. Yeah, um, stone has a, some sort of symbolism for me. It's uh, talking about eternity. Uh, the white is some spiritual energies. So. Um, it, it's kind of cohesive what I'm searching for uh, in my life. In, um, I would say it's a more spiritual experience. I think what you just said, Chen Hong, is really great, and I like what Robin said too, because whiteness doesn't necessarily mean purity or happiness, but it, it, for me it ended up being kind of a cleansing. So how this started for me, how powerful it was, was I had this, my first, actually my second one, it had a bunch of white wax kind of dripping on there, and it looked really beautiful, but when someone looked at it, they said it looks like white blood. <laughs> and I thought that was really what I was going for, is the notion of white blood, huh, huh? What's that about? Well, it's about healing, but it's not, a, it, it's not about not pain. But it had the, so sometimes when you go through some kind of experience, just allowing yourself to feel your feelings is the whiteness. Because a lot of people, it's hard to really feel what you feel. There's all these excuses in our world to take a pill or to jog or to go on a diet or whatever it is, just so you can be okay, rather than to just sit there and feel the blood, the white blood, which is healing. Mm -hmm. But it didn't mean it was happy. Necessarily, it's hard to describe, and I kind—I really was relating to Chun Hong, and that's what I was yeah. thinking. So that's kind of how it in, it started for me is this notion of white blood. But I thought it was kind of morbid or perverted to say it's white blood, so I never said it, and now I'm saying it in public. Which <laughs> <laughs> but, but but the point is well taken that you know that a lot of people don't think of art as a process because you see a finished piece, mm -hmm. but how many think of all of the parts that it took and all of the processes that it took to get just to that piece. And um, unless you do it, you just, you, you don't realize how involved it is. So maybe we could talk a little bit about the process and the process of this project, which again is a fundraiser for Manka. And I, I think this is such a, an awesome opportunity for the artificials. And if you say that quickly out there in TV land, you'll, you'll quickly see who these women are. <laughs> but they are art officials. And um, they have joined us in studio today with, um, at Butte Views and Beyond at BCAC TV, our new public access channel to discuss art. And we are thrilled that you're here. 
Caitlin. And I, I truly wish that Eve could have joined us today. Her work is just beautiful. As is she. Yes. From the pictures that she brought to our last meeting, um, they were on her phone. I know they were like 40 by 40. That's huge. Immense. And the majority is, is white landscape. Wild horses, but they're against the light, so they're dark. They're mm -hmm. like shadows of horses. Yeah. But she's fascinating. So she said there's not one drop of pure white on her painting, and it's gigantic. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what she did. That's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. Robin, why don't you tell us a little bit about the beautiful sphere that you brought in to share with us today, which is amazing, and, and what, you know, what goes into something like that? Yep, I've explored a lot of different substrates that you can um, mosaic onto, and um, I came across this garden sphere. Um, it's a polyfibercrete hollow sphere. Um, and I just, I like to go really big with my stuff, um, depending on how much time I have to work on it. But I like to hand make my tiles and get into texture and... How was it working with white? Because you're usually, you're very colorful. Yes, I was initially very frustrated that, that white for me has always um, been a tricky one. I don't usually wear a lot of white. I don't work in white, but it was it was neat to to try something new and I think it kind of looks like a cloud what I ended up making. So that's a nice idea. And then expound a little bit on the Moby Dick chapter and how that inspired you. What I like about it is that um, he starts out talking about um, all the purity and, and all this positive stuff about white. And then he says, but there's more to it. And then he gets into, you know, how it could be death. It could be um, sickness. It can be, you know, and so it, I like that he covered all of it. It wasn't just the stereotypical white that we might think of. Yeah, like look at it from all angles, which is, I think, the best approach. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, some of your public art. Uh, you have several pieces of public art um, on display throughout California. I'd, and maybe, I don't know if you're in other parts of the United States, but I do know you're in several cities in California. I have a piece in Colorado and a piece in Arizona, but yeah, most of them are in California. And when did you get your first piece of public art? My first uh, public art piece um, was actually a community art project for 20th Street Park in Chico. And um, community art has its own set of problems because you have a wide range of ability. And um, so we had toddlers and anyone walking through the park, senior citizens, um, their hands could you know, were shaking and, and I was teaching them how to smash tile and put them in the design and the designs were intricate. Um, but that was the first project. And then my first like solo public art project was the Jackson Pollock bench. Mm. Um, one of my favorites. Also in Chico. Love that. And, um, yeah, once, once you get a little bit in your portfolio, then you can start applying to other things. So then I did the Caper Acres Sea Serpent. Um, and in 2013, I did um, my largest mural, which is in Sacramento on 16th and O. And it's a three-story lizard on a five-story building. Wow. Yeah. I've seen that one. So... Do any of you uh, have any other public art out there? My, I, I got, I'm in the um, Encaustic Institute Gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which was my big career. Woohoo. Yes, which and is very, that's to be celebrated. That's a big you. deal. Thank you. And um, I'm in the Mendocino Art Center Gallery, and I'm in a Native American gallery in Nevada City called um, Vigil, Lily Vigil. And um, I am also planning probably to have an open studio during Oktoberfest. I'm not in the advertising. I didn't. I was out of town, so I, I have to market, hint hint, right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk about Oktoberfest because yeah, I think so you are all on, on. Are you all on yeah. tour? Yeah. 
Let's talk a little bit about Monca. I know that um, you can call for tickets for this event. The RSVP date is by September 14th. The phone number to call is 891-4304, or you can get a hold of Pat Macias at P-K-M-A-A-C-I-A-S at Comcast.net. And that way, it's a, a limited group. I think there's a count of 65 people. And uh, a percentage of any pa- of our paintings that are sold will go towards um, the museum. And we're going to have a lot of new eyes looking at our work, which is exciting. And, uh, and good food. there's going to be music, hors d'oeuvres, cocktails. It's going to be done well. There'll be good food, good drinks, and great art. So, and I'm sure the company will be interesting. (laughs) Well, I just want to thank all of you. Um, Again, if anyone's interested in original, beautiful art, you have just seen some of the best uh, artists in this town, in this area. Um, The art officials, uh, they are dynamite women and um, incredible artists and I'm pleased that they decided to join us today on Butte Views and Beyond. Thank you again. My name's Deborah Lucero and you know do something. Do something in the arts and get ready for Oktoberfest. Start in September, have a great time throughout October and finish it off in November just in time for Thanksgiving. Oh and well yes. Thank you. (laughs) 